wow. Every time I see that, it's just, it's a powerful, powerful poem, spoken word by a really great friend here in the 757. But I want to welcome you guys uh, to church. And I know you've been having a powerful worship experience so far. We're going to dive into God's word here today. And a couple things. I, I'm super excited to share. This is, I think, week three of this But God series. And as I was studying and preparing for this, there was so much revelation I was finding. So you're going to see me kind of look at this laptop here quite a bit for my notes because there's just a lot of stuff I want to jump into. But I'm really excited. And you may be wondering, Pastor Kyle, you know, why do you have a hat on? Like, what, what's going on? Well, you know, quarantine head right now is real. I would take this off, but you don't want to see it, and I need a haircut, and I ain't about to go to nobody's barbershop. None of that happening right now. So just pray. Hopefully it won't distract you too much. But anyways, uh, uh, one of the things I do want to highlight really quick as we get ready to jump into this message is we're going to be doing, you can probably see behind me, there's a table. We're going to do communion today. We do this every first weekend of the month. And so if you want to go to your pantry right now, grab uh, whatever you got in there. It could be crackers. Uh, it could be a bagel. Uh, I got some juice and like an English muffin or something I'm going to use here in a little bit. But just grab whatever you have. Uh, and we're going to use that a little bit later on in the service. So get ready and stay tuned uh, for that. So I'm excited to jump into what we're going to talk about today. We're going to kind of continue the conversation that Pastor Freddie had last week when he introduced us uh, to the life of David, so to speak. We're going to actually look at Psalm 23. And I'm excited to jump into this psalm particularly because uh, there's so much rich information that we can gain from, especially in this sermon, in this sermon series or uh, uh, in, in the conversation that we're having. And so I felt like, you know what? We're not at church, and, you know, it's, sometimes it's difficult to, to relate with the screen and all that stuff. I, I miss church. You know, I miss having a good time. I miss people. I miss getting around everybody. I miss shouting. So I felt like, you know, why not just bust out my shout app? You know, I got a little app right here, and why, why don't we just have a little church, get God some praise, stomp your feet, clap your hands, tell somebody, neighbor, I love God. What about, <laughs> I'm not going to keep going because I will just keep going. Yeah! I can, I can yell, scream, shout, whatever you want. I might not be on key, but God is good. Hallelujah. I'm just kidding. Some of y'all like, will you chill, relax? All right, here we go. Now we're going to wind down as we get ready to jump into the text here. We're going to begin to dive into God's word. And in this word, we're going to see something that is fascinating. Okay, all right, let me stop, right? <laughs> some of y'all are like, what is he doing? You don't know what's going on. That happens at some churches, maybe not ours, but, uh, but in others it definitely does. All right, let's, let's stop playing around. Let's jump into this. Right, I hope you guys are having fun so long, so, so far. And uh, hey, as we're jumping into this message, I want you to treat this just like you are in church, in service, in the sanctuary. Shout your TV down, high five your family members, type amen in the chat. Let's have a good time today because I really feel like there's a powerful word of hope coming to you guys uh, here today. So Psalm 23, if you have heard of this psalm before, you've read it, maybe you memorized it, just put, that's me, in the chat. Let people know right now because this is probably one of the most familiar psalms in all the Bible. Uh, and a lot of times when something's so familiar, it can become extremely difficult to see it with fresh eyes. And that's kind of the challenge that I had as I was diving into this, this text here. I wanted to be able to see what is David really trying to say. David writes this psalm actually uh, uh, towards the end of his life. And he's having some time to reflect. And he has this uh, a heart, if you will, an expression of confidence in the protective care of God as you read Psalm 23. And David expresses this, this confidence in God with, with such an absolute dependence. I mean, he's like, God is, is everything. There, there's so much uh, a relationship that you can see a history, if you will, when you look at Psalm 23. And so there's this expression of, of confidence that I notice in here, it's a process for David. He walks us through this process, this pilgrimage, if you will. Maybe you're like me, you didn't really notice the, the comparison of, of verse 1 to verse 2 to verse 3. It all kind of tells a story. There's this pilgrimage uh, through such dangerous territory, if you will. And he lands from this, or he begins rather, in this dangerous territory and then lands in what he says is the house of the Lord. And we'll talk about that here in a second. So we start from one place and we end in another. And what's incredible is that interwoven in this entire psalm is this imagery of shepherd and flock. And I, I, I think when we look at this, it sounds like really great, powerful, for some maybe flowery language uh, uh, that you know, hits the heart. But 
there's got to be something more that we can look into to, to extract from this and gain. I, I really think there is going to be today. So let's start with this question here. What does this psalm mean for us? What is it that we're grabbing a hold of? How can we find confidence in God through the processes that maybe we're walking through in life? And I think often uh, we, we will all walk through certain processes. We will all have different things that we're going through. But what what about the process of the prayers that I'm praying? Maybe you're like me and you've prayed some prayers before and you're like, God, I don't see what you're doing. I don't know what's going on. And, and I want to talk about this process of unanswered prayers. How, how do we deal with that process, that in-between phase? We're praying for something, but we don't see it happening. And, and, and we want to know, hey, hey, God is good and we, we believe the promises of God, but we just don't see the evidence of it happening just yet. What's the process of, of unanswered prayers? prayers really like. We're going to dive into how we see that. And so Psalm 23, we're going to read the first three verses here to kind of open us up to this idea. So verse one, uh, and I have the NIV, I brought my big study Bible. This is what I've been using since I've been at home. So it's, you know, highlighted and all kinds of stuff. And it's a little bit of an older version NIV. So uh, it may may read a little different in certain spots, but uh, it's still God's word. So Psalm 23, verse one says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now, we stop there really quick. The first thing I notice that David begins to express as he paints this picture for us is he has this this heart of submission. And that's the first word I want to give you is the idea of submission. You and I, to get where David's at, must first begin with this posture of submission. And we're going to, we see in these first three verses what submission really looks like in our lives. What we can expect when we have a heart of submission or when we have a posture that God is in control. So verse 1, we see when I submit to him as my shepherd, we start noticing something. David says, I shall not be in one or I shall not want. Or another translation says, I lack nothing. What he's saying really is my wanting, the things that I've been wanting, now turns into my possessions. It's what I possess already. And what do you mean, Pastor Carl? What are you saying? Look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. This verse is amazing. It says, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. So if you look at someone, I shall not be in want God's going to meet all of our needs, so there's no reason to want anything. It's not that I, I have needs that God isn't meeting. It's that I have possessions that maybe I don't even know about just yet. i got to realize what I possess because he's my shepherd. I'm submitting unto him. And so he goes into verse 2. He says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. I, I think about that in, in green pastures to me. I, I don't like to lie down in grass, and I, I, don't, I don't know all about that. So, but, but, but the imagery is speaking something powerful to us. What he's saying is these green pastures represent nourishment to the flock. It represents abundance to the flock. That God is looking to, again, supply needs over and above, not lacking anything. He says he leads us beside quiet waters. If you study that quiet waters, what he was saying is that that really represents the idea of rest and security. Follow me. We're going somewhere. Rest and security in our lives. So if you're like me, I know oftentimes when I get a little overwhelmed or when I just need some time to kind of decompress or relax, near my house there's a pond. And I kind of just go over there and I just get, you know, quiet near the quiet waters. And I just kind of detox and just let it all go. Times are crazy. There's a lot up in the air, a lot of stuff we're questioning about, we're praying through a whole lot. Sometimes we just need to get by some quiet waters and just rest and to realize God's in control, to know I'm secure in him. So again, this imagery of green pastures and and quiet waters, it may not mean a lot to us. But if you were to understand the imagery that David's using of this shepherd and flock, it means a lot to a shepherd with sheep. These conditions show absolute care. It's the, the, the conditions of provision while on a journey. That's the, the idea, and that's what unanswered prayers can feel like sometimes. Unanswered prayers feel like a journey. You start really, really high in your faith. I know God is able. He can do it. He's going to come through. And then you start praying, and you don't see something happen. You start taking a little journey. 
You start finding yourself like green pastures, quiet waters. I don't know. Things are a little stirred up right now. And you start questioning a lot. It can be like a journey, but David is trying to encourage us in that journey. He says he'll lead me to paths of righteousness. Lead me to paths of righteousness. Some translations say different, but what he's doing here is he's echoing what Proverbs 12, 28 says. The way of the godly leads to life. The path, that path does not lead to death, to no death rather, leads to no death. So we, we, we see here that this righteous path, this godly living, the Lord is leading us towards these paths. He's helping to show us the way we should go so that we can experience all that he has for us. So when I submit to him, what I'm realizing is then I'm being led toward paths of godliness, which then allow me to enjoy his protection. So all that sounds great, but why does he really do all this? The answer typically that you and I would say is because he loves us. He loves us so much. He cares about us. He sent his son to die for us. God is full of love. That's why he does all of this. But if you read verse 3, he says he guides me in paths of righteousness. Here's another reason that I never really considered. For his name's sake. For his name's sake. In other words, God's saying, yeah, I love you, but I also do all this for my reputation. I want generations to know down the line that I I never fail, that I never stop working for you, that my love never fails, that my word never comes back void, that I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does this for his own reputation as well. God has a reputation to uphold for generation to generation. So if that's not encouragement enough to you, if you're somebody right now, you're saying, look, I'm struggling to think that God loves me because I'm praying about things and I don't see him coming through. Let me tell you something. He does love you, but he's also going to come through because his reputation is on the line. It may look a little different. It may not be on your time, but he's always on time. So if I had to summarize the question or, the, or what we gained here, you know, the question would be, why, why do I submit? Let me summarize it for you. It's because I submit to him because of his own reputation. Because of his own reputation, He will protect me by leading me in paths of godliness, providing rest, security, nourishment, and abundance, showing me that he will meet all my needs because he is my shepherd. That's why I submit. That's why I choose to let him be the shepherd and I follow him. So my point to you is that in this idea of process that there is provision in the process. There's provision in the process. I know unanswered prayers are tough to deal with, but we, we can do ourselves some good if we just stop for a second and say, uh, can I just notice some of the provision in the process? Can I just find some of the things I see God doing in the process? It may not be giving me the exact answer, but there's something in the process that I could grab a hold of, that I could see God doing. And so this... All sounds amazing, but you're like, hey, Pastor Kyle, I'm, I'm still kind of in a, in a valley. I'm still dealing with some, uh, some dark stuff, and, and I'm really encouraged. I'm pumped up. I'm fired up, but that doesn't pull me out of where I'm at. I'm, I just feel like, you know, making myself feel better doesn't stop what I'm going through. So, so what do I do? Well, let's do what David did. Let's do what he did. David, in verse 4, he writes this powerful verse. He says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. He writes this verse and he's looking back. Almost imagine as he's writing verse 4. Remember, this is a reflection. David writes this towards the end of his life. He's he's thinking about his life and he writes verse 4 because he remembers all that God did for him in past valleys. He says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. How can you say that? Because you've made it through some valleys before. You've already made it through. David is remembering that right now. He remembered the moments that he prayed for God to come through and he felt like he was in darkness. Moments where he maybe didn't get the answers that he was looking for. I can think of when uh, David and Bathsheba were were getting ready to have a child and, and David was praying earnestly for the Lord to save the child's life. But it didn't happen the way David wanted it to turn out. Or maybe when Saul, King Saul, was after David 
I can imagine David being in a cave praying, God, what in the world is going on? I'm serving this guy, but he hates me. Unanswered prayers, this process, going up and down, trying to figure out what's going on. But now toward the end of his life, he started to consider how dark those moments were, and he realized something, something you and I can realize. I made it through. I made it through that valley. I made it through those past moments. I made it through all the things I never thought I could get through. I'm still standing today. I didn't think I was going to make it one month in quarantine at home, not knowing what's going to happen, not knowing what's going on. But guess what? You may be pulling your hair out. It may be tough. You may have a lot of prayers you're praying, but you made it, and you're here today, and you're watching this message right now. So if you made it through that valley, what makes you think you can't make it through another? Somebody type amen because I'm feeling like I'm ready to preach right now. I'm about to run around this whole place right now. I'm trying to contain myself because there's cameras right here. But I'm telling you, you can make it through. And, and, and how can he write something like that, 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 I, that I can, you know, I, I'll make it through this. Val- I will feel no, no evil, rather, because of the next line. The next line he writes, the reason why he says, I will fear no evil, he says, for you are with me. For you are with me. I won't have to fear any evil because I know God is with me. If I know he's with me, then I know evil and darkness and the enemy is frail in comparison to who is with me. I know that, that there's nothing that can compare to the grandeur, to the power, to the supremacy of the God that is with me, that's in me. Come on, somebody. Hello. I mean, that that imagery there, that line makes all the sense. That line is not just a feel-good line. That's a line of I remember the past, and it's pulling me out of my present. If if I feel like I'm sinking or if I feel like I'm drowning or if I feel like I'm just hurting and I'm depressed, I don't know what to do, I know he's with me. And I made it through before, I'm going to make it through again. So when we're praying and we're in the middle of the process, I feel like God is saying, I know you don't understand. I know you're confused, but consider this, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you. I don't know if I said it earlier, but that's the second thing we see in verse 4 is this this word consider. He's like, I need you to consider some things. Maybe you're looking at the process one way, but you need to see things a little different. Consider something. Consider that God is with you. Life isn't always going to be green pastures and quiet waters. We know that. But in the darkest valley, God is saying, my presence protects you. In green pastures and in quiet waters, though, God is saying, you you can see my provision in the process. You know, think about it. When life is good, we can look and say, man, God is blessing me. I see God here. I see God there. He's so good. Green pastures, quiet waters, the abundance, the nourishment. Oh, man, I see all of that. What about the darkest valley? When you're in dark valleys and you're like, man, what's going on? I feel like God is saying to us, I want you to see my presence protecting you in the process. You can see provision in some moments. I want you to see my presence protecting you in others. You know, in 2019, there was about a five-month stretch where uh, I really went through a dark valley. I went through moments where I just uh, wasn't really hearing God's voice. My family and I, you know, we're doing a lot of moving and we're trying to figure out what's next and just really trying to obey God. And and the Lord was leading us in certain paths and just really wasn't sure what was going on. But one thing I knew in the moment, it was hard to hold on to, but I knew and looking back on it, I know now is that God was protecting us. God was always there. He never left us out to uh, dry to figure things out for ourselves. No, he was always guiding. Even when it felt like it was dark, there was always still some guiding light, some still small voice that was leading me through what I was going through. And guess what? I made it out of that. And because of that, it made me stronger. So dark valleys are not wasted time. You know why? Because nothing's wasted in the kingdom of God. He uses every single thing for our good. We grow for, and look at what James chapter one, verse two through four echoes this so well. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith, that's what dark dark valleys do. They test your faith. It produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Not lacking anything. 
Your faith may get tested, but you're going to persevere. And that perseverance is going to bring maturity. And from that, you and I will realize, because he's my shepherd, I lack nothing. I lack nothing. That's the God that we serve. We submit and we consider that maybe there's a bigger picture here. And so I want you to consider something else. Consider this. God may lead you through dark valleys because there's something you need to learn from it. I know that's hard. You're like, wait, 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 you don't know my circumstance. You don't know what's going on. You mean to tell me God led me through all this? Let me not assign your situation to God, as God's hand being on it. But let me just give you something to consider. Just think about this. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 22, we see this text, this verse, uh, or the story rather, of Jesus walking on water. And I'm going to show you uh, verse 22 real quick. And, and Jesus knows what's getting ready to happen prior to what actually happens in the story. It says, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And he's thinking, well, what's so, what's so big deal about that? He told them to go on the other side. Well, if you know the story, Jesus puts these disciples in a boat and this huge storm comes, the waves and the wind, and it's, it's just going crazy. And he knew the storm was coming, but he chose to place them on that boat anyways. You may be thinking, well, why would he do that? Why not just hang out where you were? Why would God lead them there? And I'm going to pose this to you. It wasn't to destroy them. It was to disciple them. It was something that they had to learn in the midst of it. See, he knew the waves were going to be tossing uh, back and forth and, and around like crazy. But he needed to show them that he can walk on those same waves. He knew that the wind was going to blow around like crazy and scare them half to death. And they weren't, weren't going to know what to do. But he needed to show them that he can speak to the wind and tell it to be still. He knew that Peter was going to ask to, to, hey, let me come out to the water and meet you. And he invited Peter out and he knew Peter was going to walk on water. And he knew at a moment Peter was getting ready to sink. So why would he let that happen? Because he wanted to be able to show Peter that I am reaching out for your rescue. And that's the thing I want all of us to, to stop for a second and realize. If you find yourself in some dark moments, because this is a really tough time for us. It's a hard time to process. There's a lot going on. If you find yourself in some dark moments and you're wrestling, I know I've had my days. My wife had to pull me out. Don't be depressed. Don't be down. Don't beat yourself up. We'll make it through this. Everything's going to be okay. And, and if you're dealing with depression, you're dealing with loneliness, you're dealing with that, sometimes it can just feel like, you know what, I, I, I'm so stuck in this. Sometimes you don't even want to reach out for a hand. The Bible says that when Peter fell into the water, Jesus immediately reached down and pulled him up. See, sometimes you may not be reaching out, but God is always reaching in. Always reaching in, looking to rescue, looking to pull us out of those things. And what's fascinating about that story is that in one of the Gospels, I believe it says that the disciples at that moment, they realized it was the clicking moment for them to say, oh my gosh, this is the Messiah. We really see who he is. And sometimes it's hard to truly see how amazing God is unless you walk through some things, unless you, 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 you make it through some valleys, then you see how powerful this God that you believe in really is. And so I remember, uh, I remember watching this, this movie on Netflix. You know, we're all kind of on a next Netflix binge right now. And there's this one movie particularly that I watched, uh, just came out, called Extraction. It's a total guys movie. Yeah, it's explosions and guns and blood and all that kind of stuff. So if you're not into that, don't watch it. But I, I really enjoyed it. I was watching the movie, and um, one of the characters said this one line that really stood out to me. And uh, it, I almost had to pause the movie real quick and, like, type it because it was, just, it was just powerful. There was these two guys. One of them was really feeling down about something, and the other wanted to encourage him. And he said this quote, and it's, and it's this quote here. He says, you drown not by falling into a river, but by staying submerged in it. You drown not by falling into a river, but by staying submerged in it. You may feel like, hey, I'm in a valley and I'm kind of falling and I don't even know what to do right now. Let me tell you something. If you don't know how to reach out, know this. God is reaching in right now. This message, this moment, this thing you're watching, I really believe this is a divine assignment. There's a reason why God gave me this word and there's a reason why you tuned in. 
I'm not trying to be spiritually spooky. I'm just trying to be spiritually sensitive. I really feel like that this is a moment that God is saying, hey, you, yeah, it's time to come out. You don't have to drown in those emotions. It's time to come out. They are real. They are real emotions, and they are there, and the enemy may be pouncing on those things, and he's trying to, to, to use that to show you that maybe you know, you know, God isn't as good as he says he is, or, or maybe you aren't as strong as you think you are. But in all actuality, those are just lies from the enemy, and, and Jesus, our Savior, is looking to reach into those moments and pull you out. So you may be in a dark valley right now, but don't let the waters that you may feel like you're sinking in submerge you. It's time to come out of that thing. So Psalm 23, after he says all this, he, he ends the verse 4 with, Your rod and your staff, they, they comfort me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And we, we may not know what that imagery really is, but a rod and a staff, again, these are shepherd's tools. They were used for a couple things. One, for measuring the sheep. And they were also used for correcting divine discipline, if you will. You may be thinking, wait, 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 wait. God is a good God. He wouldn't want to correct us or discipline us like that, like with a rod and a staff. Like, what's going on? Well, think about this. The Bible also says that God prunes those he loves. So there there is some direction that's needed, and and there is some loving discipline that's needed. For you all that have kids, you know what I mean. You know... there, you want to make sure that stay, we're staying on the right path and that we're not going to wind up finding ourselves in another valley we shouldn't be in at, at times. But ultimately, the rod and the staff were meant for two things, guidance and protection. Looking to guide and looking to protect. And so my second point or phrase to get to you about the process is that there is protection in the process. There's protection in the process. Again, you may be praying and you're trying to figure out, God, where you at? He's protecting you. He's guiding you. He's with you. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever think that's a lie. Don't ever think that it's not, it's not true because it is. He is with us. And David realized that looking back on his life. And so I told you earlier the word was consider. So let me summarize all this here by saying this, in my darkest valleys, if I can be like David and remember all the valleys God brought me through, I can see how his presence was with me, how it was guiding me, protecting me, comforting me, and realize that nothing I went through was wasted because he uses the process to discipline or rather to disciple me and not to destroy me. God uses those processes to disciple, not to destroy That's why we can consider that he's with us. We can consider that there's something powerful happening in the process. So when I make it through the valleys, that sounds amazing. Um, What happens really? I made it out. Cool. But here's what we may not realize that we actually are getting in those valleys or after those valleys. It's this, is that we get a greater understanding of who God is. We start to understand more of who he is. I'm sure the disciples understood more about Jesus when they saw him walking on water. I'm sure the disciples saw more about Jesus and understood more about him when they realized he can make the winds and the waves be still. And how do we gain understanding by making it out of valleys or even in the valleys? Is this because if I'm guided towards paths of righteousness, I realize something, that I will still go through valleys. Better yet, I will grow through valleys but I won't conform to the fear of the valley. I don't have to conform to the fear of the valley. I love what Romans chapter 12, verse two says. One of my favorite verses. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We get a chance now to test what God's will is. In other words, we get a chance to discover what God's will is for my life. That's the third word, submit, consider, and discover. We get a chance to discover more about his greatness, more about his will, more about his provision, more about his promises for us as we're in this process. We get to discover that he's for us. I can discover what God has promised me and prepared for me, which he says in his word, it's perfect. If you're ever concerned about, man, you know, 
I want God's best for me, he says that his will for us is perfect. So just know that. You submit to him, you consider, and you begin to start discovering that God's will is perfect. So the process of unanswered prayer, prayer for that matter, is a journey. It starts with submission, continues with considering, and leads us into discovery. But discovering what? The last two verses of Psalm 23 show us what we discover. And I love these verses. And we're going to camp out here as our last slide. We discover this, is that you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Let me stop here for a second. I got a quick revelation. It's saying it, your, your goodness and your love, your mercy will follow me all the days of my life, not just in green pastures and quiet waters, but in the darkest valleys every day, no matter where I go, he is following me. He's always with me. That should be an encouragement right now. If you feel like you are sunk down, this, this whole pandemic is just stressing you out. you got financial issues, marital issues, relationship issues. You don't know what's going on. You're, you're stressed out about it. He is following us everywhere. We're never alone. All the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We start it in one place, and we end in the house of the Lord, which is really a representation of the presence of God. So we're discovering a few things. One, that he prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. He prepares a table. In the, and, and now, that may not mean a whole lot. Some, I thought about the question. I was like, man, that sounds incredible. But I'm like, who wants to eat with their enemies? <laughs> I appreciate you preparing the table. Well, what does that really mean? I got a bunch of people I don't really like around me. What he's saying, though, it, it made sense for those original readers. Because hospitality in the ancient Near East required more than just providing a meal. It was, it was more that he was showing now He's not only our shepherd, he's our host. And a host not only provides the meal, but the host was responsible for protecting their guests. And so we see he goes from shepherd to host. And he's saying, now I'm preparing you a meal before your enemies and I'm protecting you while you partake of that meal. It's almost a posture of full authority. It's like a God flex in the moment, just saying, hey, I'm preparing this thing for you that nobody can take the food off your plate that nothing the enemy tries to do can zap you or run you dry because I have more than enough I'm giving you. So we, like David, discover that he, that, that, that because rather we are protected by God, we can eat safely in the presence of our enemies. And then he said, you anoint my head with oil. Now, often in church, we think about the anointing. We think about this supernatural power of God and you're, you're so anointed and you, you, you have this special gifting or people see something on you. But in this context... Well, what happened is, is when you have a guest over and you would anoint their head, it, that fragrance of the anointing oil would fill the house. And it also put kind of like a, a sheen or a gloss on the person. It would kind of signify that this is my guest. And it was almost like a, uh, just a blessing of placing the oil. And you can kind of picture that imagery, just walking in and, and the person who's going to eat with you, you place that oil on their head and then that fragrance just fills the room. There's just something about it transforms the atmosphere. And he anoints my head with oil and my cup is overflowing. That just shows the generosity of our host, of our shepherd, of our king. That he gives us more than we need. And he's going to follow us all the days of our lives. You know, as our shepherd and our host... We can be confident that he will protect us with his unfailing love. You know, when we read Psalm 23, we see that this is a reflection of David's life. But in all actuality, it's a little something more. This was kind of foreshadowing what was going to happen, in a sense, in Jesus' life. He says, that, you know, you prepare a table before me and my enemies, and I want to head over here to do this communion. But what he talks about, just preparing a table before my enemies, what he's really referring to, in a sense, is something that happened in Jesus' life. At the Last Supper, we read that Jesus was at this table with his disciples. And the Spirit 
of Satan enters into Judas. One of the 12 at the table was Jesus. Now Jesus is at this table with his disciples, with his, his family, if you will, and there is the enemy. This is probably the second time, I believe, that he's face to face with Satan. The first being uh, when Matthew chapter 4, I believe, where Jesus is out in the wilderness and the enemy is trying to tempt him by saying, hey, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. And I can almost imagine Jesus in that moment and probably sitting at this last supper table reflecting now, <laughs> probably saying, man, you have no idea who you're talking to. I am the bread of life. Why would I turn these stones into bread? Not only that, but man shall not live off bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That is our supply. And so I just picture in this moment, Jesus is here at this table with his brothers. And then there is Judas, who has the spirit of the enemy in him. Now, I don't know about you. You may be, you know, wherever you are at the house and, or at a table, sometimes we can feel like we have enemies who are around us. But Psalm 23 tells us that God prepares a table before my enemies. And so you no longer have to eat from the plate of depression or eat from the plate of loneliness or eat from the plate of feeling lost or feeling uh, suicidal or not knowing what to do or what's going on. You no longer have to eat from those plates because God is preparing a table for you in the presence of those things. You can recline back knowing that you have a God who is on your side, that he's with you. He'll always be with you, following you. And so today, I want to encourage you, we're going to take communion. I, I have some simple things that maybe you have inside your, your pantry, some grape juice. And I encourage you, if you haven't gotten those yet, go grab some of those elements right now. It could be anything. And then I also have uh, just some <laughs> pack of English, English muffins. But it's not about the stuff. It's really about what it represents. And so today, you know, maybe you're, you're like, hey, I'm just visiting. I don't know if I can take communion with you guys. I'm not a part of your church. Absolutely. This is not the Freedom Life table. This is God's table. And Jesus at the Last Supper explained to them, he said, hey, this is my body, this bread. It's a rep representation, rather, of my body. And as often as you do eat, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. But hold on. He also tells them, this is my cup. So we just use grape juice as, as sim symbolic. And this cup represents the blood, the blood of Christ that was shed for the covering and the remission of our sins. And I want to invite you today if you're like, hey, I hear this story about Jesus and I hear this psalm. That sounds amazing. I've never asked Jesus into my heart and my Lord and Savior. Before you take communion, I want to invite you, if you've never done that before, there's a banner on the screen right now. And you can just click and say, hey, today I'm making a decision to follow Christ. If that's you, I'd encourage you to do that right now. Say yes to Jesus, what he's done for you. It's the best life you could ever live. It's the greatest choice you can ever make. Jesus at that last supper was given this body and this blood for you and I. Say yes today. Click that button if you've never made that decision. And right now as we... So we take these elements. Jesus said, as often as you do eat, do this in remembrance of me. If you've made that decision before or you're making that decision right now, let's take and let's eat. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I pulled these... Pull my phone out because I have these, these questions that I want to leave us with here. Thank you, Father. Three questions to consider, if you will. One, am I fully submitted to the Lord as my shepherd? Or am I still trying to do things my way? Number two, have I considered that maybe what I'm going through is actually something God is using to grow me through? The third and final one is, Am I willing to begin discovering God's perfect will for my life? Again, if you haven't said yes to Jesus, right now is your time. And I want to leave you with this last thing as we get ready to go into some worship. Is this last statement here that we can all remember. That I may have unanswered prayers, but God is with me in the process. Let's take that, take that with us as we get ready to head into some worship. Let's do it.